Hello, I'm Linda Eling Lee. I am the Global Head of ESG Research at MSCI. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for a new MSCI Insights video with which we are bringing our research insights to you more quickly in a more digestible format. I'm based in New York. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Guido Giza, who is part of our core equity research team based in London, and Bruno Royce, who is part of our climate research risk team, also based in London. Uh, in 2019, we published a research report in the journal Portfolio Management called The Foundations of ESG Investing, where we identified the economic transition channels through which companies' ESG characteristics impact their risk and return. Although this paper also considered climate as part of the financial materiality of ESG factors for certain sectors, today I am happy to share our latest research paper in which we focused exclusively on climate and studied the financial impact of climate transition risk, in particular in global equity markets. And I'd like to start by asking Guido to give us a little bit of background. Um, what questions did you want to address in your paper and, and what were the underlying assumptions of your analysis? Yeah, thank you, Linda, for the question. So the purpose of this research paper was to answer the fundamental question whether and how equity markets price climate transition risk. Now, to analyze this question, we used a very traditional structure of a risk model that I summarized on this slide here, where we basically assume that any financial impact seen in markets is linked to a risk exposure and a risk driver. And this structure allows us to decompose this very fundamental question into three subsets. The first question being, what type of financial impact do we see in terms of earnings, stock price valuation levels? The second question being, how do we measure or how can we approximate a company's exposure to climate transition risk? And the third question being, what is driving the repricing of equities in the market. We actually started with the third question, the drivers, because it's the first part, it's the beginning of the causation chain. Now, to, to look for or to understand the risk drivers, it's helpful to recall the difference between uncertainty and risk as it was defined by Professor Knight in 1921. So exactly 100 years ago, and I summarized it on this slide here, and basically, Climate risk is different from traditional risk like market risk and, or credit risk in the sense that there is a lot of unknown information, unknown probability distributions, and even efficient markets can only price known information. They can't price unknown information. But what we've seen in the past couple of years, there was a lot of new information appearing in the market. The Paris Agreement, new, uh, new policies regarding climate change, new technologies, electric vehicles, wind farms, and so on. And the first question we addressed in the paper, whether this, new, this flow of new information is the driver behind climate transition risk. Well, thank you, Guido. Now let's turn to Bruno for the first question. What are the economic drivers of climate change and what transmission channels have you identified? Yes, thanks, Linda. So we looked at uh, two types of economic drivers and transmission channels. The first one is climate policies. So um, nearly everywhere in the world, we find that governments are implementing stricter climate policies. Uh, and of course, that has an effect on companies um, that are operating in the economy. So we have a, so that's the first uh, driver, climate policies, and the transmission channel is the one that I'm showing on this slide here. Uh, so it starts with stricter climate policies leading to uh, targets in terms of uh, less greenhouse gas emissions, so tighter greenhouse gas emission uh, targets. And of course, this then has a broader operational impact on companies, and this impact uh, eventually materializes in uh, uh, costs and earnings. And eventually, as we know, the, the price uh, of the stocks of companies uh, will therefore be impacted as well uh, through the earnings channel. So that's the first uh, transmission channel. And, and so we tested that in, in several ways. And I'm just going to show uh, one way uh, here is uh, an intuitive way is to look, for example, at uh, how climate policies are more or less ambitions around the world and what that implication, what are the implications for that in, in stock markets. 
so you can see here on, on the slide on left hand side, I have a, a world map, which is color coded and green, for example, in Europe shows uh, the countries where the, the climate policies are more ambitious. Red, for example, in some of the emerging markets shows where it's less ambitious and you can see the US is somewhere in between. And on the right hand side, we've uh, looked at the, the price uh, performance of various uh, companies in different uh, geographic regions and how uh, the, the what the difference in return was between the companies that were the more carbon efficient versus the less carbon efficient. So you can see that in uh, the MSCI world X USA, which is primarily Europe, the greener companies or less carbon intensive companies uh, tend to perform better than the more carbon intensive. You can see that emerging markets, uh, the green line is the other way around and the USA is somewhere in between. So this is really in line with what we see, uh, the, you know, with the ambitions of the, the climate policies around the world. The second uh, economic driver is uh, the flip side of, of climate policies, which is the, the green technologies. So here, the transmission channel that we are looking at is uh, companies investing into green uh, research and development, uh, which leads to owning of green technologies, uh, which then leads to a growth in the earnings uh, and the revenue uh, coming from low carbon uh, technologies, uh, which then in turn leads to uh, growth in the, in the stock performance as well. So better stock performance. And here we tested this uh, by looking at um, in the sectors that typically uh, see companies with more uh, low carbon revenues, we tested what the impact was of um, the, the, the propensity to have more green revenues on both the earnings growth and on the stock returns. And you can see that, uh, in, especially in the more carbon intensive sectors, the utilities, materials, and energy, uh, there's a big impact there. So companies which were, everything else being equal, uh, that had more green revenues versus those that had less re green revenues, had more earnings growth and had more returns as well. Uh, in the industrials, IT and real estate, this was a little bit less so, but still, uh, still a positive relationship there. Great. Well, let's dig into the financial performance a bit more. So Guido, um, how has climate risk affected stock price performance or earnings growth uh, performance over this period? And did climate change risk actually qualify as an equity risk factor? Yes, I mean, that is the key question. So in this study, we looked at the potential financial impact of climate transition risk on companies' earnings, valuation levels, and of course, stock performance. And we used the MSI Acqui IMI as benchmark universe. I just want to show you two examples here. The first example, we looked at the valuation impact of companies holding fossil fuel reserves. That is important because, you know, fossil fuel reserves are potentially stranded assets. So what we did, and this is shown on this slide here, we looked at the utilities and the energy sector because they hold the majority of fossil fuel reserves in the benchmark universe. And we compared the price to book valuation level of companies holding less fossil fuel reserves to companies holding more fossil fuel reserves. And we looked for differences in price to book valuation. What you see in here is the valuation difference in price to book ratio has increased over time over the past years, which means companies holding more fossil fuel reserves saw their price to book valuation levels go down. That means equity markets started to price a discount on companies holding fossil fuel reserves. So basically come, uh, equity markets become more and more pessimistic on the value of these potentially stranded assets. So this is how we looked at valuation. We found, by the way, similar picture in green technology. We found companies generating a lot of green revenues. They saw their valuation levels increase over time. So in line with the narrative, the economic transition channel that Bruno just highlighted. But of course, what investors are probably most interested in is stock price impact. So what we did is we took companies' total emission profile, so that is the aggregate of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and we imported this company's, company's emission profile into our factor model as a potential risk exposure. And we asked the risk model whether uh, there was a stock price impact associated with the emission profile of companies. Basically, after stripping out all other equity factors, whether there was a stock price effect linked 
to the emission profile. And you see the outcome of the analysis on this slide here, and we've seen that there has been a positive cumulative factor return linked to companies' emission profile over time, which basically means on average, greener companies tended to outperform browner companies. And what is interesting is this outperform started very slowly in 2015, which is the year that the Paris Agreement was signed, and it has clearly accelerated during the past two or three years, which is very much in line with the narrative and the economic transmission channel that Bruno pointed out, that we've seen an increasing level of new policies, new regulation coming out that drives the, the repricing of, of stocks. What is important to mention is that this stock price impact was not uniformly distributed across the benchmark universe. It was very much folk concentrated in the wings, meaning the very carbon intense companies on the left and the very green, the solutions, the green tech companies on the right. Whereas about three quarters of MSI Aqui IMI was not affected at all. So it's a very non-uniform effect. It was also very non-linear. So even in the affected wings, the, the relationship between specific return and carbon emission profile was very non-linear. And as you can see here, it was accelerating over time. But the interesting thing is using carbon emissions as an ex risk exposure, we found clear ev evidence for a financial impact in terms of valuation levels, stock price, and also in terms of earnings. Well, that's a lot of very insightful results there. Um, but Bruno, you know, maybe in very concrete terms, what are the lessons that investors can learn from these results? Yes, thanks, Linda. So I think that the, the concrete implications are some of the ones that uh, Guido has already highlighted. So number one, we can see pricing impacts of transition risk, uh, but it's uh, accelerated tremendously in the last two years, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. Uh, the other thing is that we can also see that the, the, the different types of stocks are not impacted by transition risk in the same way. And I'm showing here on this slide, uh, a, slide with, a graph which looks quite complicated, but um, the idea is that it shows for different types of companies how transition risk has impacted the returns. And here what you can see is that in the green line, uh, which are the solutions companies, the companies that are uh, typically providing solutions for, for climate mitigation, you can see that there's a lot of convexity, which means really that the transition risk profile of a company within the solutions uh, category has a big impact on the, on, on the return. And on the other side of the spectrum, the asset stranding, which are the companies that are uh, the most impacted by transition risk, you can see that there's also some, some convexity there showing that the climate transition risk profile of the companies have an impact. By comparison, the other ones that are in between the product transition, the operation transition and the neutral, those uh, lines are nearly straight lines. They don't show convexity, which tells us that there is less differentiation. So that's, I think it's uh, very interesting because it shows that the pricing of climate transition risk is really uh, in the tails as well as in the last two years. So what does that mean for investors? Well, in my opinion, this raises a few very interesting questions. First one is, will this process continue? Are we going to continue to see uh, uh, pricing impacts of transition risk in those, in those categories? Is it going to continue uh, to accelerate as well? Um, and in my opinion, one uh, very interesting uh, question is, will we see pricing impacts move from the tails or the wings of the distribution into the middle of the distribution? Because a common narrative is that, um, transition risk will impact all companies. The transition to a low carbon economy is going to impact everyone. But what we're seeing now in equity markets is actually that's not really the case. It impacts the very brown companies, the very carbon intensive companies, and it impacts the very green companies, the, you know, the climate champions. But in the middle, we don't see so much of an impact. And so one question, um, which uh, we will have to wait to find out is, is this pricing impact going to move in the middle and start impacting uh, potentially all companies uh, in, in equity markets? Well, thank you, Bruno, and thank you, Guido. If you'd like to learn more, uh, there's a lot more details in the paper, and you can come and download the paper at msci.com slash research. Um, and please do stay tuned for the next paper in which we're going to be looking at the practical implications of transition risks for investors in terms of risk management and portfolio construction. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.